Chapter Seven of Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy, read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Seven. On the morning appointed for her departure, Tess was awake before dawn. At the marginal minute of the dark, when the grove is still mute, save for one prophetic bird who sings with a clear-voiced conviction that he at least knows the correct time of day, the rest preserving silence, as if equally convinced that he is mistaken. She remained upstairs packing till breakfast-time, and then came down in her ordinary weekday clothes, her Sunday apparel being carefully folded in her box. Her mother expostulated, "'You will never set out to see you folks without dressing up more the dan than that.' "'But I'm going to work,' said Tess. "'Well, yes,' said Mrs. Durbeyfield, and in a private tone, "'At first there may be a little pretensant, but I think it will be wiser, Ivy, to put your best side outward,' she added. "'Very well.' "'I suppose you know best,' replied Test, with calm abandonment. And so, to please her parent, the girl put herself quite in Joan's hands, saying serenely, "'Do what you like with me, mother.' Mrs. Durbeyfield was only too delighted at this tractability. First she fetched a great basin, and washed Tess's hair with such thoroughness that when dried and brushed, it looked twice as much as at other times. She tied it with a broader pink ribbon than usual. Then she put upon her the white frock that Tess had worn at the club walking, the airy fullness of which, supplementing her enlarged coiffure, imparted to her developing figure an amplitude which belied her age, and might cause her to be esteemed as a woman, when she was not much more than a child. "'I declare there's a hole in my stocking-heel,' said Tess. "'Never mind holes in your stockings. They don't speak. When I was a maid, so long as I had a pretty bonnet, the devil might have found me in heels.' Her mother's pride in the girl's appearance led her to step back, like a painter from his easel, and survey her work as a whole. "'You must see yourself,' she cried. It is much better than you was on t'other day." As the looking-glass was only large enough to reflect a very small portion of Tess's person at one time, Mrs. Durbeyfield hung a black cloak outside the casement, and so made a larger reflector of the panes, as is the wont of bedecking cottagers to do. After this she went downstairs to her husband, who was sitting in the lower room. "'I'll tell ye what tis, Durbeyfield,' she said exultingly. he will never have the heart not to love her. And whatever you do, don't say too much to Tess of his fancy for her, and this chance she has got. She is such an odd maid, that it mid set her against him, or against going there even now. And if all goes well, I shall certainly be for making some return to that parson at Stagfoot Lane for telling us.' Dear good man. However, as the moment for the girl's setting out drew nigh, when the first excitement of the dressing had passed off, a slight misgiving found place in Joan Durbeyfield's mind. It prompted the matron to say that she would walk a little way, as far as to the point where the acclivity from the valley began its first steep ascent to the outer world. At the top, Tess was going to be met with the spring cart sent by the Stoke d'Urbervilles, and her box had already been wheeled ahead towards the summit by a lad with trucks to be in readiness. Seeing their mother put on her bonnet, the younger children clamoured to go with her. "'I do want to walk a little ways with Sissy, now she's going to marry her gentleman cousin and wear fine clothes.' "'Now,' said Tess, flushing and turning quickly, "'I'll hear no more of that. Mother, how could you ever put such stuff into their heads? Go into work, my dear, for our rich relation, and help get enough money for a new horse. 
said Mrs. Durbeyfield pacifically. "'Good-bye, father,' said Tess, with a lumpy throat. "'Good-bye, my maid,' said Sir John, raising his head from his breast as he suspended his nap, induced by a slight excess this morning in honour of the occasion. "'Well, I hope my young friend will like such a comely sample of his own blood, and tell him, Tess, that being quite sunk, quite from our former grandeur, I'll sell him the title, yes, sell it, and at no unreasonable figure. "'Not for less than a thousand pound,' cried Lady Durbeyfield. "'Tell him I'll take a thousand pound. Well, I'll take less when I come to think of it. He'll adorn it better than a poor lammockin fellow like myself can. Tell him he shall have it for a hundred, but I won't stand upon trifles. Tell him he shall hae it for a fifty, for twenty pound. Yes, twenty pound, that's the lowest. Damn he, family honour is family honour, and I won't take a penny less. Tess's eyes were too full, and her voice too choked to utter the sentiments that were in her, she turned quickly and went out. So the girls and their mother all walked together, a child on each side of Tess holding her hand, and looking at her meditatively from time to time, as at one who is about to do great things. Her mother just behind with the smallest, the group forming a picture of honest beauty, flanked by innocence, and backed by a simple-souled vanity. They followed the way till they reached the beginning of the ascent, on the crest of which the vehicle from Trantridge was to receive her, this limit having been fixed to save the horse the labour of the last slope. Far away behind the first hills the cliff-like dwellings of Shaston broke the line of the ridge. Nobody was visible in the elevated road which skirted the ascent, save the lad whom they had sent on before them sitting on the handle of the barrow that contained all Tess's worldly possessions. "'Bide here a bit, and the cart will soon come, no doubt,' said Mrs. Durbeyfield. "'Yes, I see it yonder.' It had come, appearing suddenly from behind the forehead of the nearest upland, and stopping beside the boy with the barrow. Her mother and the children thereupon decided to go no further, and bidding them a hasty good-bye, Tess bent her steps up the hill. They saw her white shape draw near to the spring-cart, on which her box was already placed. But before she had quite reached it, another vehicle shot out from a clump of trees on the summit, came round the bend of the road there, passed the luggage-cart, and halted beside Tess, who looked up as if in great surprise. Her mother perceived, for the first time, that the second vehicle was not a humble conveyance like the first, but a spick-and-span gig or dog-cart, highly varnished and equipped. The driver was a young man of three or four-and-twenty, with a cigar between his teeth, wearing a dandy cap, drab jacket, breeches of the same hue, white neckcloth, stick-up collar, and brown driving-gloves. In short, he was the handsome, horsey young buck who had visited Joan a week or two before to get her answer about Tess. Mrs. Durbeyfield clapped her hands like a child. Then she looked down and stared again. Could she be deceived as to the meaning of this? "'Is dat the young gentleman kinsman who makes Sissy a lady?' asked the youngest child. Meanwhile the muslin form of Tess could be seen standing still, undecided, beside this turnout, whose owner was talking to her. Her seeming indecision was, in fact, more than indecision, it was misgiving. She would have preferred the humble cart. The young man dismounted and appeared to urge her to ascend. She turned her face down the hill to her relatives, and regarded the little group. Something seemed to quicken her to a determination, possibly the thought that she had killed Prince. She suddenly stepped up. He mounted beside her, and immediately whipped on the horse. In a moment they had passed the slow cart with the box, and disappeared behind the shoulder of the hill. Directly Tess was out of sight, and the interest of the matter as a drama was at an end, 
the young one's eyes filled with tears. The youngest child said, "'I wish poor, poor Tess wasn't gone away to be a lady,' and lowering the corners of his lips, burst out crying. The new point of view was infectious, and the next child did likewise, and then the next, till the whole three of them wailed loud. There were tears also in Joan Durbeyfield's eyes as she turned to go home. But by the time she had got back to the village she was passively trusting to the favour of accident. However, in bed that night she sighed, and her husband asked her what was the matter. "'Oh, I don't know exactly,' she said. "'I was thinking that perhaps it would have been better if Tess had not gone.' "'Oughtn't ye to have thought of that before?' "'Well, tis a chance for the maid. Still, if twere the doing again, I wouldn't let her go till I had found out whether the young gentleman is really a good-hearted young man, and choice over her as his kinswoman.' "'Yes, you ought perhaps to have done that,' snored Sir John. Joan Durbeyfield always managed to find consolation somewhere. Well, as one of the genuine stock, she ought to make her way with him, if she plays her trump card aright, and if he don't marry her afore, he will after. For that, he's all afire with love for her. Any eye can see that. What's her trump card? Her d'Urberville blood, you mean? No, stupid. Her face, as twas mine. End of chapter seven. Chapter Eight of Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy, read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Eight. Having mounted beside her. Alec d'Urberville rode rapidly along the crest of the first hill, chatting compliments to Tess as they went, the cart with her box being left far behind. Rising still, an immense landscape stretched around them on every side, behind the green valley of her birth, before a grey country of which she knew nothing except from her first brief visit to Trantridge. Thus they reached the verge of an incline, down which the road stretched in a long, straight descent of nearly a mile. Ever since the accident with her father's horse, Tess Darbyfield, courageous as she naturally was, had been exceedingly timid on wheels. The least irregularity of motion startled her. She began to get uneasy at a certain recklessness in her conductor's driving. "'You will go down slow, sir, I suppose?' she said, with an attempted unconcern. D'Urberville looked round upon her, nipped his cigar with the tips of his large white centre teeth, and allowed his lips to smile slowly of themselves. "'Why, Tess,' he answered, after another whiff or two, "'it isn't a brave, bouncing girl like you who asks that.' "'Why, I always go down at full gallop. There's nothing like it for raising your spirits. But perhaps you need not now.' "'Ah,' he said, shaking his head, "'there are two to be reckoned with. It's not me alone. Tib has to be considered, and she has a very queer temper.' "'Who?' "'Why, this mare. I fancy she looked round at me in a very grim way just then. Didn't you notice it?' "'Don't try to frighten me, sir,' said Tess, stiffly. "'Well, I don't. If any living man can manage this horse, I can. I won't say any living man can do it, but if such has the power, I am he.' "'Why do you have such a horse?' "'Ah, well, may you ask it. It was my fate, I suppose. Tib has killed one chap, and just after I bought her she nearly killed me. And then—' Take my word for it, I nearly killed her. But she's touchy still, very touchy, and one's life is hardly safe behind her sometimes. 
They were just beginning to descend, and it was evident that the horse, whether of her own will or of his, the latter being the more likely, knew so well the reckless performance expected of her that she hardly required a hint from behind. Down, down they sped, the wheels humming like a top, the dog-cart rocking right and left, its axis acquiring a slightly oblique set in relation to the line of progress, the figure of the horse rising and falling in undulations before them. Sometimes a wheel was off the ground, it seemed for many yards. Sometimes a stone was set spinning over the hedge, and flinty sparks from the horse's hoofs outshone the daylight. The aspect of the straight road enlarged with their advance, the two banks dividing like a splitting stick, one rushing past at each shoulder. The wind blew through Tess's white muslin to her very skin, and her washed hair flew out behind. She was determined to show no open fear, but she clutched at d'Urberville's rein arm. "'Don't touch my arm. We shall be thrown out if you do. Hold on round my waist.' She grabbed his waist, and so they reached the bottom. "'Safe, thank God, in spite of your fooling,' said she, her face on fire. "'Tess, fie! That's temper,' said d'Urberville. "'Tis truth.' "'Well, you need not let go your hold of me so thanklessly the moment you feel yourself out of danger.' She had not considered what she had been doing, whether he were man or woman, stick or stone, in her involuntary hold on him. Recovering her reserve, she sat without replying, and thus they reached the summit of another declivity. "'Now, then, again!' said d'Urberville. "'No, no!' said Tess. "'Show more sense, do, please. "'But when people find themselves on one of these highest points of the county, "'they must get down again,' he retorted. "'He loosed rein, and away they went a second time. "'D'Urberville turned his face to her as they rocked, and said, in playful raillery, "'Now, then, put your arms around my waist again, as you did before, my beauty.' "'Never,' said Tess, independently holding on as well as she could without touching him. "'Let me put one little kiss on those Holmbury lips, Tess, or even on that warmed cheek, and I'll stop. On my honour I will.' Tess, surprised beyond measure, slid further back still on her seat, at which he urged the horse anew, and rocked her the more. "'Will nothing else do?' she cried at length in desperation her large eyes staring at him like those of a wild animal. This dressing her up so prettily by her mother had apparently been to lamentable purpose. "'Nothing, dear Tess,' he replied. "'Oh, I don't know very well. I don't mind,' she panted miserably. He drew rein, and as they slowed he was on the point of imprinting the desired salute, when, as if hardly aware of her own modesty, she dodged aside. His arms being occupied with the reins, there was left him no power to prevent her manoeuvre. "'Now, damn it, I'll break both our necks,' swore her capriciously passionate companion. "'So you can go from your word like that, you young witch, can you?' "'Very well,' said Tess. "'I'll not move since you be so determined. But I thought you would be kind to me and protect me as my kinsman.' "'Kinsman be hanged! Now!' "'But I don't want anybody to kiss me, sir,' she implored, a big tear beginning to roll down her face, and the corners of her mouth trembling at her attempts not to cry. "'And I wouldn't have come if I had known.' He was inexorable, and she sat still, and d'Urberville gave her the kiss of mastery. No sooner had he done so than she flushed with shame took out her handkerchief, and wiped the spot on her cheek that had been touched by his lips. His ardour was nettled at the sight, for the act on her part had been unconsciously done. "'You're mighty sensitive for a cottage girl,' said the young man. Tess made no reply to this remark, of which, indeed, she did not quite comprehend the drift, unheeding the snub she had administered by her instinctive rub upon her cheek. She had, in fact, undone the kiss, as far as such a thing was physically possible. 
with a dim sense that he was vexed, she looked steadily ahead as they trotted on near Melbury Down and Windgreen, till she saw, to her consternation, that there was yet another descent to be undergone. "'You shall be made sorry for that,' he resumed, his injured tone still remaining, as he flourished the whip anew. "'Unless, that is, you agree willingly to let me do it again, and no handkerchief.' She sighed. "'Very well, sir,' she said. "'Oh, let me get my hat.' At the moment of speaking her hat had blown off into the road, their present speed on the upland being by no means slow. D'Urberville pulled up and said he would get it for her, but Tess was down on the other side. She turned back and picked up the article. "'You look prettier with it off, upon my soul, if that's possible,' he said, contemplating her over the back of the vehicle. "'Now then, up again. What's the matter?' The hat was in place and tied, but Tess had not stepped forward. "'No, sir,' she said, revealing the red and ivory of her mouth, as her eye lit in defiant triumph. "'Not again, if I know it.' "'What? You won't get up beside me?' "'No, I shall walk.' "'It's five or six miles yet to Trantridge.' "'I don't care if tis dozens. Besides, the cart is behind.' "'You artful hussy! Now, tell me, didn't you make that hat blow off on purpose?' I'll swear you did." Her strategic silence confirmed his suspicion. Then d'Urberville cursed and swore at her, and called her everything he could think of for the trick. Turning the horse suddenly, he tried to drive back upon her, and so to hem her in between the gig and the hedge, but he could not do this short of injuring her. "'You ought to be ashamed of yourself for using such wicked words.' cried Tess with spirit from the top of the hedge into which she had scrambled. "'I don't like ye at all. I hate and detest you. I'll go back to mother, I will.' D'Urberville's bad temper cleared up at the sight of hers, and he laughed heartily. "'Well, I like you all the better,' he said. "'Come, let there be peace. I'll never do it any more against your will. My life upon it now.' Still Tess could not be induced to remount. She did not, however, object to his keeping his gig alongside her, and in this manner, at a slow pace, they advanced towards the village of Trancheridge. From time to time d'Urberville exhibited a sort of fierce distress at the sight of the tramping he had driven her to undertake by his misdemeanour. She might, in truth, have safely trusted him now. But he had forfeited her confidence for the time, and she kept on the ground progressing thoughtfully as if wondering whether it would be wiser to return home. Her resolve, however, had been taken, and it seemed vacillating even to childishness to abandon it now, unless for graver reasons. How could she face her parents, get back her box, and disconcert the whole scheme for the rehabilitation of her family on such sentimental grounds? A few minutes later the chimneys of the slopes appeared in view and in a snug nook to the right, the poultry farm and cottage of Tess's destination. End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of Tess of the D'Urbervilles This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tess of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy, read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 9 The community of fowls to which Tess had been appointed as supervisor, purveyor, nurse, surgeon, and friend, made its headquarters in an old thatched cottage, standing in an enclosure that had once been a garden, but there was now a trampled and sanded square. The house was overrun with ivy, its chimney being enlarged by the boughs of the parasite to the aspect of a ruined tower. The lower rooms were entirely given over to the birds, who walked about them with a proprietary air, as though the place had been built by themselves, and not by certain dusty copyholders who now lay east and west in the churchyard. 
The descendants of these bygone owners felt it almost as a slight to their family when the house, which had so much of their affection, had cost so much of their forefathers' money, and had been in their possession for several generations before the d'Urbervilles came and built here, was indifferently turned into a fowl house by Mrs. Stoke d'Urberville as soon as the property fell into hand according to law. "'Twas good enough for Christians in grandfather's time,' they said. The rooms wherein dozens of infants had wailed at their nursing now resounded with the tapping of nascent chicks. Distracted hens in coops occupied spots where formerly stood chairs supporting sedate agriculturalists. The chimney-corner and once blazing hearth was now filled with inverted beehives in which the hens laid their eggs while out of doors the plots that each succeeding householder had carefully shaped with his spade were torn by the cocks in wildest fashion. The garden in which the cottage stood was surrounded by a wall, and could only be entered through a door. When Tess had occupied herself about an hour the next morning in altering and improving the arrangements according to her skilled ideas as the daughter of a professed poulterer, the door in the wall opened, and a servant in white cap and apron entered. She had come from the manor-house. "'Mrs. D'Urberville wants the fowls as usual,' she said. But perceiving that Tess did not quite understand, she explained, "'Mrs. is an old lady, and blind.' "'Blind?' said Tess. Almost before her misgiving at the news could find time to shape itself, she took— under her companion's direction, two of the most beautiful of the Hamburgs in her arms, and followed the servant, who had likewise taken two, to the adjacent mansion, which, though ornate and imposing, showed traces everywhere on this side that some occupant of its chambers could bend to the love of dumb creatures, feathers floating within view of the front, and hen-coops standing on the grass. In a sitting-room on the ground floor, ensconced in an armchair with her back to the light, was the owner and mistress of the estate, a white-haired woman of not more than sixty, or even less, wearing a large cap. She had the mobile face frequent in those whose sight has decayed by stages, has been laboriously striven after, and reluctantly let go rather than the stagnant mean apparent in persons long sightless or born blind. Tess walked up to this lady with her feathered charges, one sitting on each arm. "'Ah! Are you the young woman come to look after my birds?' asked Mrs. D'Urberville, recognising a new footstep. "'I hope you will be kind to them. My bailiff tells me you are quite the proper person. Well, where are they?' Ah, this is Strutt. But he is hardly so lively to-day, is he? He is alarmed at being handled by a stranger, I suppose. And Fenner, too. Yes, they are a little frightened, aren't you, dears? But they will soon get used to you." While the old lady had been speaking, Tess and the other maid, in obedience to her gestures, had placed the fowls severally in her lap and she had felt them over, from head to tail, examining their beaks, their combs, the manes of the cocks, their wings, and their claws. Her touch enabled her to recognise them in a moment, and to discover if a single feather were crippled or draggled. She handled their crops, and knew what they had eaten, and if too little or too much, her face enacting a vivid pantomime of the criticisms passing in her mind. The birds that the two girls had brought in were duly returned to the yard, and the process was repeated till all the pet cocks and hens had been submitted to the old woman. Hamburgs, bantams, cockins, brahmas, dorkins, and other such sorts as were in fashion just then, her perception of each visitor being seldom at fault when she received the bird upon her knees. It reminded Tess of a confirmation in which Mrs. D'Urberville was the bishop, the fowls the young people presented, and herself and the maid-servant the parson and curate of the parish bringing them up. 
At the end of the ceremony Mrs. D'Urberville abruptly asked Tess, wrinkling and twitching her face into undulations, "'Can you whistle?' "'Whistle, ma'am?' "'Yes, whistle tunes.' Tess could whistle, like most country girls, though the accomplishment was one which she did not care to profess in genteel company. However, she blandly admitted that such was the fact. "'Then you will have to practice it every day. I had a lad who did it very well, but he is left. I want you to whistle to my bullfinches. As I cannot see them, I like to hear them. And we teach him airs that way.' Tell her where the cages are, Elizabeth. You must begin to-morrow, or they will go back in their piping. They have been neglected these several days. "'Mr. D'Urberville whistled to him this morning, ma'am,' said Elizabeth. "'He? Pooh!' The old lady's face creased into furrows of repugnance, and she made no further reply. Thus the reception of Tess by her fancied kinswoman terminated and the birds were taken back to their quarters. The girl's surprise at Mrs. D'Urberville's manner was not great, for since seeing the size of the house she had expected no more. But she was far from being aware that the old lady had never heard a word of the so-called kinship. She gathered that no great affection flowed between the blind woman and her son. But in that, too, she was mistaken. Mrs. D'Urberville was not the first mother compelled to love her offspring resentfully, and to be bitterly fond. In spite of the unpleasant irritation of the day before, Tess inclined to the freedom and novelty of her new position in the morning, when the sun shone, now that she was once installed there, and she was curious to test her powers in the unexpected direction asked of her, so as to ascertain her chance of retaining her post. As soon as she was alone within the walled garden, she sat herself down on a coop, and seriously screwed up her mouth for the long-neglected practice. She found her former ability to have degenerated to the production of a hollow rush of wind through the lips, and no clear note at all. She remained fruitlessly blowing and blowing, wondering how she could have so grown out of the art which came by nature till she became aware of a movement among the ivy boughs which cloaked the garden wall no less than the cottage. Looking that way she beheld a form springing from the coping to the plot. It was Alec d'Urberville, whom she had not set eyes on since she had conducted her the day before to the door of the gardener's cottage, where she had lodgings. "'Upon my word!' cried he. There never was before such a beautiful thing in nature or art as you. Look, Cousin Tess!" Cousin had a faint ring of mockery. "'I have been watching you from over the wall, sitting like impatience on a monument, and pouting up that pretty red mouth to whistling shape, and wooing and wooing and privately swearing, and never being able to produce a note. Why? You are quite cross because you can't do it." "'I may be cross, but I didn't swear.' "'Ah! I understand why you're trying. Those bullies! My mother wants you to carry on their musical education. How selfish of her! As if attending to these cursed cocks and hens were not enough work for any girl. I would flatly refuse if I were you.' "'But she wants me particularly to do it, and to be ready by to-morrow morning.' "'Does she? Well, then, I'll give you a lesson or two. "'Oh, no, you won't,' said Tess, withdrawing towards the door. "'Nonsense! I don't want to touch you. See, I'll stand on this side of the wire netting, and you can keep on the other side, so you may feel quite safe. Now, look here. You screw up your lips too harshly. There, tis so.' He suited the action to the word, and whistled a line of— Take, O oh, take, those lips away!" But the illusion was lost upon Tess. "'Now try,' said d'Urberville. She attempted to look reserved. Her face put on a sculptural severity. But he persisted in his demand, and at last, to get rid of him, she did put up her lips as directed for producing a clear note. 
laughing distressfully, however, and then blushing with vexation that she had laughed. He encouraged her with, "'Try again!' Tess was quite serious, painfully serious by this time, and she tried, ultimately and unexpectedly emitting a real, round sound. The momentary pleasure of success got the better of her. Her eyes enlarged, and she involuntarily smiled in his face. "'That's it. Now I have started you. You'll go on beautifully. There. I said I would not come near you. And in spite of such temptation as never before fell to mortal man, I'll keep my word. Tess, do you think my mother a queer old soul?' "'I don't know much of her yet, sir.' You'll find her so. She must be to make you learn to whistle to her bullfinches. I'm rather out of her books just now, but you will be quite in favour if you treat her livestock well. Good morning. If you meet with any difficulties and want help here, don't go to the bailiff. Come to me." It was in the economy of this regime that Tess Durberfield had undertaken to fill a place. Her first day's experiences were fairly typical of those which followed through many succeeding days. A familiarity with Alec d'Urberville's presence, which that young man carefully cultivated in her by playful dialogue and by jestingly calling her his cousin when they were alone, removed much of her original shyness of him, without, however, implanting any feeling which could engender shyness of a new and tenderer kind but she was more pliable under his hands than a mere companionship would have made her, owing to her unavoidable dependence upon his mother, and through that lady's comparative helplessness upon him. She soon found that whistling to the bullfinches in Mrs. D'Urberville's room was no such onerous business when she had regained the art for she had caught from her musical mother numerous airs that suited those songsters admirably. A far more satisfactory time than when she practised in the garden was this whistling by the cages each morning. Unrestrained by the young man's presence, she threw up her mouth, put her lips near the bars, and piped away in easeful grace to the attentive listeners. Mrs. D'Urberville slept in a large four-post bedstead, hung with heavy damask curtains, and the bullfinches occupied the same apartment, where they flitted about freely at certain hours, and made little white spots on the furniture and upholstery. Once, while Tess was at the window when the cages were ranged, giving her lesson as usual, she thought she heard a rustling behind the bed. The old lady was not present and, turning round, the girl had an impression that the toes of a pair of boots were visible below the fringe of the curtains. Thereupon her whistling became so disjointed that the listener, if such there were, must have discovered her suspicion of his presence. She searched the curtains every morning after that, but never found anybody within them. Alec d'Urberville had evidently thought better of his freak to terrify her by an ambush of that kind. End of chapter 9、chapter、ten of Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tess of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 10 Every village has its idiosyncrasy, its constitution, often its own code of morality. The levity of some of the younger women in and about Trantridge was marked and was perhaps symptomatic of the choice spirit who ruled the slopes in that vicinity. The place had also a more abiding defect. It drank hard. The staple conversation on the farms around was on the uselessness of saving money, and smock-fronted arithmeticians, leaning on their ploughs or hoes, 
would enter into calculations of great nicety to prove that parish relief was a fuller proposition for a man in his old age than any which could result from savings out of their wages during a whole lifetime. The chief pleasure of these philosophers lay in going every Saturday night, when work was done, to Chaseborough, a decayed market-town two or three miles distant, and returning in the small hours of the next morning to spend Sunday in sleeping off the dyspepsic effects of the curious compound sold to them as beer by the monopolizers of the once independent inns. For a long time Tess did not join in the weekly pilgrimages, but under pressure from matrons not much older than herself, for a fieldman's wages being as high at twenty-one as at forty, marriage was early here, Tess at length consented to go. Her first experience of the journey afforded her more enjoyment than she had expected, the hilariousness of the others being quite contagious after her monotonous attention to the poultry farm all week. She went again and again, being graceful and interesting, standing moreover on the momentary threshold of womanhood her appearance drew down upon her some sly regards from loungers in the streets of Chaseborough. Hence, though sometimes her journey to the town was made independently, she always searched for her fellows at nightfall to have the protection of their companionship homeward. This had gone on for a month or two, when there came a Saturday in September on which a fair and a market coincided and the pilgrims from Trantridge sought double delights at the inns on that account. Tess's occupations made her late in setting out, so that her companions reached the town long before her. It was a fine September evening, just before sunset, when yellow lights struggle with blue shades in hair-like lines, and the atmosphere itself forms a prospect without aid from more solid objects except the innumerable winged insects that dance in it. Through this low-lit mistiness Tess walked leisurely along. She did not discover the coincidence of the market with the fair till she had reached the place, by which time it was close upon dusk. Her limited marketing was soon completed, and then, as usual, she began to look about for some of the Trantridge cottages. At first she could not find them, and she was informed that most of them had got on to what they called a private little jig at the house of a hay-trusser and peat-dealer who had transactions with their farm. He lived in an out-of-the-way nook of the townlet, and in trying to find her course thither her eyes fell upon Mr. D'Urberville standing at a street-corner. "'What, my beauty? You here so late?' he said. She told him that she was simply waiting for company homeward. "'I'll see you again,' said he over her shoulder, as she went down the back lane. Approaching the hay-trusses she could hear the fiddled notes of a reel proceeding from some building in the rear, but no sound of dancing was audible, an exceptional state of things for these parts, where, as a rule, the stamping drowned the music. The front door being open, she could see straight through the house into the garden at the back as far as the shades of night would allow, and, nobody appearing to her knock, she traversed the dwelling and went up the path to the outhouse whence the sound had attracted her. It was a windowless erection used for storage, and from the open door there floated into the obscurity a mist of yellow radiance, which at first Tess thought to be illuminated smoke but on drawing nearer she perceived that it was a cloud of dust lit by candles within the outhouse, whose beams upon the haze carried forward the outline of the doorway into the wide night of the garden. When she came close and looked in she beheld indistinct forms racing up and down to the figure of the dance the silence of their footfalls arising from their being overshoe in scroff, that is to say, the powdery residuum from the storage of peat and other products, the stirring of which by their turbulent feet created the nebulosity that involved the scene. 
through this floating dusty debris of peat and hay mixed with the perspirations and warmth of the dancers and forming together a sort of vegeto-human pollen the muted fiddles feebly pushed their notes in marked contrast to the spirit with which the measure was trodden out they coughed as they danced and laughed as they coughed of the more rushing couples there could barely be discerned more than the highlights the indistinctness shaping them to satyrs clasping nymphs a multiplicity of pans whirling a multiplicity of syrinxes lotus attempting to elude priapus and all was failing at intervals a couple would approach the doorway for air and the haze no longer veiling their features the demigods resolved themselves into the homely personalities of our own next-door neighbours could trantridge in two or three hours have metamorphosed itself thus madly some salenti of the throng sat on benches and hay trusses by the wall and one of them recognised her the maids don't think it respectable to dance at the flower de luce he explained they don't like to see everybody see which be their fancy men. Besides, the house sometimes gets shut up just when their gents begin to get greased. So we come here and send out for liquor. And when be any of you going home? Asked Tess with some anxiety. Now, almost directly. This is all but the last jig. She waited. The reel drew to a close, and some of the party were in the mind for starting but others would not, and another dance was formed. This would surely end it, thought Tess, but it merged into yet another. She became restless and uneasy, yet having waited so long it was necessary to wait longer. On account of the fair the roads were dotted with roving characters of possibly ill intent, and, though not fearful of measurable dangers, she feared the unknown. Had she been near Marlott, she would have had less dread. "'Don't he be nervous, my dear good soul,' expostulated between his coughs a young man with a wet face, and his straw hat so far back upon his head that the brim encircled it like the nimbus of a saint. "'What's your hurry? Tomorrow is Sunday, thank God, and we can sleep it off in church time. Now have a turn with me?' She did not abhor dancing, but she was not going to dance here. The movement grew more passionate. The fiddlers behind the luminous pillar of cloud now and then varied the air by playing on the wrong side of the bridge or with the back of the bow. But it did not matter. The panting shapes spun onwards. They did not vary their partners if their inclination were to stick to previous ones. Changing partners simply meant that a satisfactory choice had not as yet been arrived at by one or other of the pair, and by this time every couple had been suitably matched. It was then that the ecstasy and the dream began, in which emotion was the matter of the universe, and matter but an adventitious intrusion likely to hinder you from spinning where you wanted to spin. Suddenly there was a dull thump on the ground. A couple had fallen, and lay in a mixed heap. The next couple, unable to check its progress, came toppling over the obstacle, and in a cloud of dust rose around the prostrate figures amid the general one of the room, in which a twitching entanglement of arms and legs was discernible. "'You shall catch it for this, my gentleman, when you get home.' burst in female accents from the human heap, those of the unhappy partner of the man whose clumsiness had caused the mishap. She happened also to be his recently married wife, in which assortment there was nothing unusual at Trantridge, as long as any affection remained between wedded couples. Indeed, it was not uncustomary in their later lives to avoid making odd lots of the single people between whom there might be a warm understanding. A loud laugh from behind Tess's back in the shade of the garden united with the titter within the room. She looked round and saw the red coal of a cigar. Alec d'Urberville was standing there alone. He beckoned to her 
and she reluctantly retreated toward him. "'Well, my beauty, what are you doing here?' She was so tired after her long day and her walk that she confided her trouble to him, that she had been waiting ever since he saw her to have their company home, because the road at night was strange to her. "'But it seems they will never leave off, and I really think I will wait no longer.' "'Certainly do not. I have only a saddle-horse here to-day, but come to the Flower de Luce, and I'll hire a trap and drive you home with me.' Tess, though flattered, had never quite got over her original mistrust of him, and despite their tardiness she preferred to walk home with the work-folk. So she answered that she was much obliged to him, but would not trouble him. I have said that I will wait for them, and they will expect me to now." "'Very well, Miss Independence. Please yourself. Then I shall not hurry. My good Lord, what a kick-up they're having there!' He had not put himself forward into the light, but some of them had perceived him, and his presence led to a slight pause and a consideration of how the time was flying. As soon as he had relit a cigar and walked away, the Trantridge people began to collect themselves from amid those who had come in from other farms, and prepared to leave in a body. Their bundles and baskets were gathered up, and half an hour later, when the clock chime sounded a quarter past eleven, they were straggling along the lane which led up the hill towards their homes. It was a three-mile walk along a dry white road, made whiter to-night by the light of the moon. Tess soon perceived, as she walked in the flock, sometimes with this one, sometimes with that, that the fresh night air was producing staggerings and serpentine courses among the men who had partaken too freely. Some of the more careless women also were wandering in their gait, to wit a dark virago, Car Darch, dubbed Queen of Spades, till lately a favourite of d'Urberville's. Nancy, her sister, nicknamed the Queen of Diamonds, and the young married woman who had already tumbled down. Yet, however terrestrial and lumpy their appearance just now to the mean, unglamoured eye, to themselves the case was different. They followed the road with a sensation that they were soaring along in a supporting medium, possessed of original and profound thoughts themselves and surrounding nature forming an organism of which all the parts harmoniously and joyously interpenetrated each other. They were as sublime as the moon and stars above them, and the moon and stars were as ardent as they. Tess, however, had undergone such painful experiences of this kind in her father's house that the discovery of their condition spoilt the pleasure she was beginning to feel in the moonlight journey. Yet she stuck to the party for reasons above given. In the open highway they had progressed in a scattered order, and now their route was through a field gate, and the foremost finding a difficulty in opening it, they closed up together. This leading pedestrian was Carr, the Queen of Spades, who carried a wicker basket containing her mother's groceries, her own draperies, and other purchases for the week. The basket being large and heavy, Carr had placed it for convenience of porterage on the top of her head, where it rose in jeopardised balance as she walked with arms akimbo. "'Well, whatever is that a-creepin' down thy back, Carr Darch?' said one of the group suddenly. All looked at Carr. Her gown was a light cotton print, and from the back of her head a kind of rope could be seen descending to some distance below her waist, like a Chinaman's queue. "'Tis her hair falling down,' said another. No, it was not her hair. It was a black stream of something oozing from her basket, and it glistened like a slimy snake in the cold still rays of the moon. "'Tis treacle,' said an observant matron. Treacle it was. Carr's poor old grandmother had a weakness for the sweet stuff. Honey she had in plenty out of her own hives, but treacle was what her soul desired, and Carr had been about to give her a treat of surprise. 
Hastily lowering the basket, the dark girl found that the vessel containing the syrup had been smashed within. By this time there had arisen a shout of laughter at the extraordinary appearance of Carr's back, which irritated the dark queen into getting rid of the disfigurement by the first sudden means available, and independently of the help of the scoffers. She rushed excitedly into the field they were about to cross, and, flinging herself flat on her back upon the grass, began to wipe her gown as well as she could by spinning horizontally on the herbage and gathering herself over it upon her elbows. The laughter rang louder. They clung to the gate, to the posts, rested on their staves in the weakness engendered by their convulsions at the spectacle of Carr. Our heroine, who had hitherto held her peace, at this wild moment could not help joining in with the rest. It was a misfortune, in more ways than one. No sooner did the dark queen hear the soberer, richer tone of Tess among those of the other work-people, than a long, smouldering sense of rivalry inflamed her to madness. She sprang to her feet and closely faced the object of her dislike. "'How darest thou laugh at me, hussy?' she cried. "'I couldn't really help it when t'others did,' apologized Tess, still tittering. "'Ah, thus think the best everybody does, because the best first favourite were he just now. But stop a bit, my lady, stop a bit. I'm as good as two of such. Look here, here's at thee. To Tess's horror the dark queen began stripping off the bodice of her gown, which, for the added reason of its ridiculed condition, she was only too glad to be free of, till she had bared her plump neck, shoulders, and arms to the moonshine, under which they looked as luminous and beautiful as some Praxitelian creation, in their possession of the faultless rotundities of a lusty country girl. She closed her fists and squared up at Tess. "'Indeed, then, I shall not fight,' said the latter, majestically. "'And if I had known you was of that sort, I wouldn't have let myself down as to come with such a horridge as this is.' The rather too inclusive speech brought down a torrent of vituperation from other quarters upon fair Tess's unlucky head, particularly from the Queen of Diamonds, who, having stood in the relations to d'Urberville that Carr had also been suspected of, united with the latter against the common enemy. Several other women also chimed in, with an animus that none of them would have been so fatuous as to show but for the rollicking evening they had passed. Thereupon, finding Tess unfairly browbeaten, the husbands and lovers tried to make peace by defending her, but the result of that attempt was directly to increase the war. Tess was indignant and shamed. She no longer minded the loneliness of the way and the lateness of the hour. Her one object was to get away from the whole crew as soon as possible. She knew well enough that the better among them would repent of their passion the next day. They were all now inside the field, and she was edging back to rush off alone, when a horseman emerged almost silently from the corner of the hedge that screened the road and Alex d'Urberville looked round upon them. "'What the devil is all this row about, work-folk?' he asked. The explanation was not readily forthcoming, and in truth he did not require any. Having heard their voices while yet some way off, he had ridden creepingly forward, and learnt enough to satisfy himself. Tess was standing apart from the rest near the gate. He bent over toward her. "'Jump up behind me,' he whispered, "'and we'll get shot of the screaming cats in a jiffy.' She felt almost ready to faint, so vivid was her sense of the crisis. At almost any other moment of her life she would have refused such proffered aid and company, as she had refused them several times before, and now the loneliness would not of itself have forced her to do otherwise 
but coming, as the invitation did, at the particular juncture when fear and indignation at these adversaries could be transformed by a spring of the foot into a triumph over them, she abandoned herself to her impulse, climbed the gate, put her toe upon his instep, and scrambled into the saddle behind him. The pair were speeding away into the distant grey by the time that the contentious revellers became aware of what had happened. The Queen of Spades forgot the stain on her bodice, and stood beside the Queen of Diamonds and the newly married, staggering young woman, all with a gaze of fixity in the direction in which the horse's tramp was diminishing into silence on the road. "'What be ye looking at?' asked a man who had not observed the incident. "'Ho, ho, ho!' laughed a dark car. "'He, he, he!' laughed the tippling bride, as she steadied herself on the arm of her fond husband. "'He, he, he!' laughed Dark Car's mother, stroking her moustache as she explained laconically, "'Out of the frying-pan into the fire!' Then these children of the open air, whom ever excess of alcohol could scarcely endure permanently, betook themselves to the field-path and as they went there moved onward with them around the shadow of one's head a circle of opalized light, formed by the moon's rays upon the glistening sheet of dew. Each pedestrian could see no halo but his or her own, which never deserted the head-shadow, whatever its vulgar unsteadiness might be, but adhered to it, and persistently beautified it till the erratic motions seemed an inherent part of the irradiation, and the fumes of their breathing a component of the night's mist, and the spirit of the scene, and of the moonlight, and of nature, seemed harmoniously to mingle with the spirit of the wine. End of chapter 10